Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is really exciting. Um, I'm Patty Saberi. I'm faculty at the Division of Prevention Science at UCSF. And I'm so honored to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Corinne Dubé, who's a senior sociobehavioral scientist um, and uh, who integrates biomedical, social science, ethics, patient engagement around HIV-related research for both U.S. and South Africa. Um, she has so many amazing things listed in her um, CV and uh, her list of accomplishments. It's like, it's insane. And I could probably spend a few hours just reading through that. Um, I won't. Um, some of the interesting things that she does also is that she's a, in addition to HIV cure related research, she's also a lead researcher and bioethicist on the last gift project that I'm sure she'll uh, touch upon. And if she doesn't, please ask her because it's super interesting. Um, and so in this presentation, um, she's going to be mainly talking about um, analytical treatment interruptions for HIV cure related research. And as a personal note, I've known Corinne for several years and um, I had a pleasure of being an MPI with her on a recent R21 on HIV cure uh, research uh, among young adults with HIV. And um, just to give you an idea of how amazingly prolific Corinne is, we published over four, 15 papers <laughs> with just a small two year award. Um, and she's already presented multiple uh, times on these data. So it's really exciting to see all the work that she's been doing. Um, and I'm so excited to hear all the new work that she has upcoming. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Dubey, please take it away. Thank you very much, Badia. Thank you so much for having me today to talk about the need for multidisciplinarity in HIV cure related research. And I'll be focusing this talk around partner protections to promote global ethical research. That's been a timely issue recently, so that will be the focus of my talk, but I'll also be highlighting a lot of the work that we've done collaboratively with um, UCSF um, and the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies. So thank you all so much for having me. Um, so here's a brief overview. We'll talk a little bit about um, HIV cure related research and treatment interruptions or ATIs. So you'll hear this acronym a lot. Uh, we'll present some results from recent empirical studies. We'll present a partner protections package or P3 framework um, that we're advocating for and discuss uh, recent work from a partner protections working group in the AIDS clinical trials group. And then we'll have a discussion around moving cure related trials to resource limited parts of the world and what might be some of the implications there. And then we'll end with some ethical considerations, possible next steps, and we'll open it up for discussion. And um, we'll give lots of shout outs and acknowledgements to folks who have been part of this work and this journey. So background on cure-related research and ATIs. So in cure-related research, we pursue um, one of two goals, either complete elimination of HIV from the body, which is a very high bar to achieve, or uh, the more realistic goal, would be sustained or durable antiretroviral free uh, control or suppression. So a treatment that we could stop that could keep um, HIV under control without uh, um, ART. And there are multiple strategies being investigated, including um, latency reversal agents to reawaken HIV that's become dormant inside the cells or block and lock to keep HIV permanently silent. Um, immune-based approaches to boost the immune system, cell and gene therapy approaches to make cells resistant to HIV, uh, but most likely we'll need a combination of approaches because HIV is a very complex virus. So most likely we'll need to use these strategies in combination with a treatment interruption. So with treatment interruptions, uh, we uh, this means that participants and partners uh, face potential risk. So there are risks for the participants who interrupt their treatment and also risk for partners without HIV. That means they can also acquire HIV. So we'll be talking a lot about partner protections in this talk, mostly the need for HIV prevention as part of cure trials or um, uh, mitigation of the risk of HIV transmission. So, uh, so far, there have been over 250 cure-related studies 
implemented worldwide. Not all of them have used treatment interruptions, but more and more um, scientists are using treatment interruptions because there's no uh, biomarker that's available that could predict when virus will return. And so ATIs are currently needed, um, but ideally we would not have to use them. Um, but now it's one of the tools that we have. And globally, there's around uh, $330 million invested each year in HIV cure-related research, and several groups are implementing uh, cure-related trials, including the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, um, private groups like MFAR, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, industry, and um, academia, including UCSF and UCSD. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about what an ATI is. Um, and why they are needed and, and how they are used in cure-related trials. So um, this is part of research. It is not part of standard of care. And during ATIs, uh, research teams are very closely monitoring participants. So that includes all the safety labs, including viral loads and CD4 counts, um, to make sure that we don't reach like any um, uh, unsafe thresholds. So participants are monitored very closely, and we also ask them to stay in very close contact with their HIV care team. And ATIs have evolved quite a bit um, over the years. Some of the old drug con conservation studies were actually some of the precursor studies to cure-related research, um, and they had long ATIs. And then uh, Maybe five years ago, we had short or brief ATIs that were called uh, for as soon as a person had a viral rebound or return of virus uh, treatment would be um, restarted. But some of the newer ATIs actually are much more um, uh, less, are much more permissive, um, and they may last weeks to months. So there's been a meeting, uh, a consensus meeting, where um, it, it was found that long-term ATIs may be needed in order to detect post-intervention control. Um, so ATIs are not all created equal. So if medicines are effective, why pause them? So HIV hides in uh, reservoirs um, in different cells and tissues. And the goal of many cure studies or cure-related studies is to reduce the size of that reservoir and then teach the immune system to control the reservoir. So ATIs are needed to determine when a cure-related intervention may be able to increase immune function. So some people think that virus needs to return in the blood in order for the immune system to take over and then control the virus on its own. So what can we learn from an ATI? We can learn if a participant is a post-intervention controller, and we can learn if the immune system has, taught, uh, has been taught to control HIV. And um, there are different types of experimental therapies where ATIs might be necessary. For example, everything that works with the immune system. So all the immune-based approaches, like therapeutic vaccines that aim to jumpstart the immune system, or broadly neutralizing antibodies that defend the bodies from various particles, and then clear these infectious particles. Cell and gene therapy, um, which are meant to change the immune system in order to prevent HIV from entering that cell. And then combination approaches also use ATIs. Um, and the, the two strategies that likely would not use an ATI would be a latency reversal agent, uh, which would decrease the reservoir, and we have other ways to measure um, its effect. And then pediatric cure trials, ATIs probably would not be warranted until at least two years of age. Um, in 2018, there was a very pivotal moment in the field where about 56 people came together in the same room for one day and debated how to make these ATIs uh, safe and ethical. And this also represented a shift in the field where it became more acceptable to do longer term ATIs. So people had to sort of rebound and stay by remix in order to see what happens with the immune system. But that also means that people uh, participants would be at, at risk of transmitting HIV to their sex partners. So there was also consensus that we need to offer PrEP and HIV testing referral information to participants. And so that was really when we first started to really discuss what it meant to protect partners of participants in cure-related trials. Um, and so 
at that point, there was really a shift in the field and an increasing belief that we needed to see a rebound in Varinia before we could detect a post-intervention control. And that some of the earlier studies had restarted uh, treatment too early and uh, resulted in uh, us uh, scientists missing this uh, post-intervention control. Um, and so uh, since then, uh, our social behavioral colleagues uh, have been engaged in trying to understand how we could uh, engage people in cure-related trials with treatment interruptions, including uh, considerations for increasing racial, ethnic, gender, and sex diversity in cure-related trials with ATIs. Um, because the these trials had not been diverse um, up to this point. So this was a study implemented um, during COVID where we studied um, 21 in-depth, um, uh, we, we conducted 21 in-depth interviews with five different types of informants and we engaged community members. We also analyzed the data using conventional content analysis and extracted considerations for implementing ATI trials in diverse communities and settings. And what we found is that we really need to pay attention to gender and power dynamics. So most trials consider the participants as being part of the trial and then the partner as not being part of the study. But what we, we found is that we also must pay attention to partners and gender and power dynamics, age and power differentials, race, ethnicity, the status of partners, and also the partnership status, and whether um, intimate partner violence is present in the relationship. We also found that tr trials should be implemented through the lens of intersectionality and equity, and that calls for more, more social behavioral sciences. Um, we, we'll also need to be able to bridge career related research with HIV prevention, and we'll need to incorporate social behavioral sciences as part of cure related trials with um, extended ATIs. So this seems very obvious, um, but it's not always a given in our field. Um, so here are some of the quotes from our community members. It brings together so many colliding issues, right? When you talk about the rates of domestic violence or intimate partner violence against women with HIV, they're exponentially higher than that of the general population. And so to bring into play a partner's participation in her trial, it just increases her level of vulnerability. We want to do the ethical thing and offer prep to a partner, but we, we must also first evaluate the woman's ability to have an open dialogue with her partner about her participation in the clinical trial. And so what we learn is that to implement ATI trials safely and ethically, we will need to weigh the risks for the participant and the partners. Um, moving forward. And then we also learned that uh, ATI trials could have different impacts on stigma. So stigma relates to multiple interlocking experiences of oppression, which include racism, sexism, gender binarism, heterosexism, and transphobia. And that HIV care related trials could affect stigma in different ways. Stigma could be increased as a result of people becoming viremic and staying viremic and being at risk of transmitting HIV to their sex partners in an era of U equals U, or stigma could be reduced as a result of helping advance the search towards an HIV cure. And so we'll need a lot more research to understand the impact of ATI, related, uh, ATI trials on stigma. And Dr. John Susida and myself are currently um, incorporating stigma measures um, as part of ATI trials um, to really see the longitudinal effect on stigma. We've already talked about partnership dynamic. So our goal is to really minimize um, the risk of potential social harms when implementing ATI trials. So we want the diversity, we want the equity, we want the representation, but at the same time, we do not want to cause undue harm. And so this study also um, pointed us to the importance of implementing trauma-informed research as much as possible and really helping participants um, evaluate different trade-offs um, as they engage in cure-related trials. Um, as Dr. Pa uh, Saberi mentioned earlier, uh, this was a really exciting project um, that we implemented with um, UCSF called Youth for Cure, where we surveyed um, diverse young people aged 18 to 29 um, across the U.S. about their willingness to participate in cure-related research. And what we found is that 
young people face a lifelong prospect of HIV. So we should minimize risk um, at all costs. That includes both the physical and the clinical risks, but also the social risks and the financial risks. And uh, we also found the critical importance of offering disclosure um, support to young people because younger people have not had as many opportunities to, to disclose their HIV status. Um, and also because we now live in the era of U equals U. So there's a generation that has only known U equals U. And then research team will also need to help young people overcome barriers to HIV prevention, uh, particularly in communities that remain underserved. So these are the groups who weren't represented in cure trials. They're also the groups that remain underserved with respect to HIV prevention services in the US. So that seems that may seem obvious to some, um, but this also points to the need for more and more social behavioral sciences in cure-related trials as we seek to engage more diverse participant um, in cure trials. And just anecdotally, in the antibody-mediated prevention um, trials uh, or AMP trials, they had 0% PrEP uptake among partners. Um, so we do have a lot of work um, ahead of us. Um, so these are some of the data from the Youth Project um, that was done in collaboration with Dr. Padia Saberi and Chad Campbell, uh, formerly UCSF, now at UCSD. Um, and what we see here is that um, the risk that would most likely uh, deter young people from being part of a cure study would be to have virus levels going up unexpectedly. So 59% would be deterred a lot of, or a great deal. And then in terms of social risk, the risk of transmitting HIV while off treatment during the study would deter a 65% of young people a lot or a great deal as well. So we need to really pay attention to those data because that's really the future of cure-related research. These are our future participants. Um, this is another slide from the same study where we ask young people uh, whether they would choose an HIV control strategy uh, where they would no longer have to take pills every day. Um, and then the vast majority would um, accept this trade-off um, if they, even if they would have to go to the clinic more often, let's say every month, or um, even if the new strategy had moderate side effects initially, but these eventually went away. But if we look at the bottom of the figure, we could see that 68% of young people would be would not accept the trade-off that if this strategy would uh, increase their chance of passing HIV to a sex partner, um, they would not be willing to accept this trade-off. And then when we ask about the importance of partner protection strategies to participate in cure-related studies involving ATIs, we found that the vast majority of young people with HIV in the US were highly supportive of these different um, prevention strategies. So that includes HIV testing and counseling for partners, uh, providing PrEP and referral for PrEP, providing condoms for partners, and then assisting young people with disclosures. Um, so it points to the need to really support our young participants um, in these clinical trials. And then a separate study, this was pre-COVID. Um, it was conducted in collaboration with Dr. Tonya Potit, um, who's an alum of the UCSF CAPS Visiting Professor Program. In this study, we found that um, Black uh, transgender women living with HIV in the U.S. would really want to know that researchers had their back if they were to interrupt treatment. So this study really point out the need for uh, gender and racial um, equity framework and also using trauma-informed research lens when implementing um, clinical trials that that use treatment interruptions. And then this is another study that was conducted with diverse zero different partners in the United States that was uh, conducted as part of my uh, applied research experience with um, UCSF visiting professor program. So very grateful to the R25 for supporting this work and to my mentor, Dr. Mallory Johnson and uh, a collaborator at UCSF, Amy Conroy, who helped with the dyadic data analysis, who advised on the analysis, and also Judy Auerbach, John Tosida, and everyone who collaborated on this study. So in this study, uh, we found that uh, diverse or different couples were highly satisfied with their current medication. 
And they also had mixed understanding and knowledge around U equals U. In fact, some of them um, thought U equals U meant gender equality, not undetectable is untransmittable. They also expressed discomfort around ETIs using cure research and were worried about passing or acquiring HIV during ATIs. They were also in strong favor of robust partner protections during ATIs and rec recommended that partners be consulted and involved as part of ATI trials, sort of challenging the current paradigm that only the participants are part of the study. But we also found that partners are deeply implicated by ATI trials. Here's a quote. Um, so for me, that's access to the full prevention toolbox and not just some part of it or what's most convenient. So for me, it's a great opportunity to sit down and make sure that PrEP is available both daily and on demand, making sure that post-exposure prophylaxis is readily available. Now there's a clear way for a partner to access it in case that's the choice of where they want to go. That would be a non-negotiable for me. Otherwise, there's no way I'm going to sign up for that. So this is a person with HIV. Um, hey, Karen, and then, yes. Sorry, do you want questions at the end or is it okay if folks ask questions as you're... Maybe okay. let's keep them for the end because we'll open it up for discussion as well. Great, um, thanks. So please keep your questions until the end um, and then we'll have a really rich discussion. Um, so UCSF has been really proactive about this topic of partner protection. Um, and this has really been led by Dr. Michael Peluso, who's really engaged the MFAR Institute for HIV Cure Research and the Delaney AIDS Research Enterprise or DARE Community Advisory Board really early when we start having these conversations in the community. So kudos to UCSF. Um, so Michael was one of the first people to really look at this from a collaborative multidisciplinary approach to HIV transmission risk mitigation during ATIs, where we really inventory participant level challenges, the partner level challenges, and the study level challenges, and we created ways to mitigate those challenges. And that resulted in creating a lot of support uh, tools for participants and their partners, including the counseling guides and disclosure uh, checklists and prep referral education material, really active navigation with the HIV prevention world for participants and their partners. Um, and so that was one of the first um, uh, partner prevention, partner protection package that was developed was in collaboration with UCSF. And then um, it, the NIH in August, 2021, um, organized a meeting on addressing challenges that limit participation in HIV trials with ATIs that involved a lot of community members who really share their experience being part of an ATI. Um, so that was led by uh, Tia Morton and Larry Fox at NIH with lots of community people. Um, and they really kept their promise to the community there. And that led to this uh, partner protection package or P3 paper, where we argued for the need uh, to uh, for a P3 uh, partner protection package to address the ethical and feasible concerns about the risk of HIV transmission to sex partners of participants in ATI trials. So we make the case for a P3 and why it's needed, including the fact that ATIs remain the key methodological approach to evaluate experimental cure research interventions. The fact that they're becoming longer, we're talking months to even years, and the fact that HIV, uh, ATI-related transmissions have already occurred in the context of therapeutic vaccine trials. In fact, we have two documented cases so far. And something else we're not mentioning here is the advent of long-acting antiretroviral therapy um, that would also make ATIs a lot more difficult. So in the P3 paper, uh, we conduct an ethical analysis that's informed by community-driven conversations, facilitated by dates, and the experience um, with partner protections in U.S.-based trials. And we also did a focused literature review with partner protections and the ethics of risk to third parties. So how do we mitigate the risks of bystanders? Um, and so this led to this framework, this comprehensive ethical framework called P3 where we identified considerations for protecting partners, provided the ethical justifications, and summarized the ways of implementing these considerations. Pretty much going back to the HIV prevention literature and looking at the evidence. We also looked at 
um, ethical justifications that would exclude certain basic considerations. So this is very analogous to the standard of prevention package that's been used in HIV prevention trials for, say, the last two decades. So in prevention trials, for example, we a vaccine trial or PrEP, we do have to provide the standard of prevention. So this is very analogous, but for partners of ETI participants. Um, and so we provide three considerations, ensuring the scientific and social value of an ETI, reducing the likelihood of unintended transmission, and ensuring prompt management of any acquired HIV during an ATI. And so we detail the possible ways to reduce the likelihood of unintended transmission, including carefully engaging participants, enabling and encouraging participants to protect their partners, enabling and encouraging partners to protect themselves, monitoring participants and study results, selecting appropriate trial sites, and practicing good communication and building trust with our communities. And so this is an example of what we show in the P3 paper. So under enabling and encouraging participants to protect their partners, we looked at the literature and here we recommend really providing information or counseling on HIV testing, HIV prevention, which includes both uh, barrier protection, condoms, or biomedical prevention like PrEP and PEP if needed, and then using evidence-based materials and approaches in a range of formats, also offering peer support and providing mental health support and counseling referrals as needed and so on. As you can see, there's a, an extensive list here. And so in the last year, we've also worked with community members, including Tom Villa, Bill Freshwater was on the call today, uh, Michael Peluso was a co-chair of this ACTG AIDS Clinical Trials Group Partner Protection Working Group to really advocate for this within the network as they are scaling up um, ATI trials um, in the U.S. and also in resource-limited countries. So the primary objective um, was to create a practical framework for partner protections as a key deliverable. And here we really want to help support research teams and participants in their collaborative efforts to mitigate the risk of unintended transmission during ATIs. And our goal was to support continued success and safety of cure-related trials. And so in the last year, we worked um, with the working group on designing this toolkit, sort of, um, sort of uh, reviewing what we had done with Michael Peluso and colleagues and uh, refining some of these tools. Um, and also we, uh, found out we needed to add more tools as part of the toolkit, including uh, counseling guides around art readherence following a treatment interruption. Um, because even after a treatment interruption, when people restart ART, there's going to be a period of resuppression of the virus. So uh, it's not recommended to resume unprotected sexual activity right away as people restart the ART. It's going to take some time. Um, and then we also engage with the VTN, HVTN, HIV Vaccine Trials Network, and PTN, and see what they had done as well. Um, uh, Bill Freshwater led the development of a very robust uh, uh, resources around legal risk and criminalization, which is much more of an issue um, here in the United States. We also reviewed the informed consent language for ACTG studies. Um, Tom Villa also um, designed uh, a wonderful tool to guide participants around the meaning of different barrel load measurements. Um, and this is the, the tool. So really using a like green light, yellow light, um, red light approach um, to graphically explain to participants when it's safe and non-safe to have uh, unprotected sex during ATIs. Um, and also uh, re-explaining uh, the meaning of U equals U and what the, the different viral load measurements mean during an ATI. And we're currently now working with the Outreach Recruitment and Retention Group to uh, format all of these um, materials that was developed at central level. And with the working group, we also have identified many potential next steps as well. We are still waiting on uh, Reauthorization for the Partner Protection Working Group, we were given one year. So currently we are on hold um, and we're working with the Outreach Recruitment Retention Group to format the toolkit. We know that this would require a lot of adaptation at local level and we'll need a systematic mapping of who will need these tools. We still need to build consensus around need to have versus nice to have elements. Um, it would also be nice to pilot test a lot of these tools and generate 
scientific evidence around best practice. We are incorporating some social behavioral research questions in ongoing um, ATI trials right now. Um, and then uh, similar to the way the standard of prevention package needed updating over time, we'll also need to update the partner protection uh, work, uh, toolkit. And then there are other networks as well implementing similar um, trials. And we, it'd be nice to have an industry sponsor as well if we're talking about um, PrEP. So at the same time, we've been advocating with the community on developing um, home-based blood collection uh, tools to measure viral load at home. So right now, uh, we've just finished testing the STASO device as part of two cure-related trials with treatment interruptions in Philadelphia. We found a very high acceptability rate of this device, and there was an 87% success rate in using the device um, as part of the trial. Participants found it very convenient, comfortable, easy to use, safe, and relatively painless. Um, ideally, we would have a tool that could tell participants right away at home if they are detectable or undetectable. Um, we're still working on that, and we're also uh, waiting for results of the reliability day, the re reliability testing of this device. Um, so hopefully there'll be more work with this device and more attempts to um, incorporate it as part of cure-related trials with treatment interruptions. And then with Tom Villa and several other community members, we've been working on a four-part um, series in Positively Aware, where this is a community-driven um, project where participants, former ATI trial participants are sharing their experience of being an ATI and what they would have liked to see. We also asked them about partner protections if they're willing to answer. And what we found is actually there's a, still a lot of unmet needs around um, partner protections and psychosocial supports as part of ATI trials. And uh, partner protection is only a small part of what would be needed for a comprehensive support program around HIV and analytical treatment interruptions. We also need a lot more work around informed consent, around explaining uh, potential risks of ATIs, around legal risks, which we talked about. Um, and then during ATIs, we also um, need a lot more uh, mental health support for participants. Um, and then after ATIs, there will be different outcomes of these clinical trials. Some participants will be back on ART, Others will be post-intervention controllers and they'll be in that period of uncertainty. And um, this is the group that will probably need a lot more uh, partner protection support. And then people who will be cured will still have needs as well. And we really need to be very proactive about anticipating um, what people uh, who are cured will need, including not for them to not lose their social benefits, um, housing benefits, and so on. So there's still a lot of advocacy to really support participants uh, through the entire ATI and through their entire uh, trajectory of participation. And partner protection is only a very small part of that. Um, and so as part of the UCSF um, uh, JAWS study, this is a combination HIV cure trial. It's been named JAWS because it's just a, a big study with five interventions. Uh, that's led by Dr. Steve Deeks and Michael Peluso at UCSF. They've been really kind to uh, have us collaborate with them. So Dr. Soseda and myself are um, doing the social behavioral research component of the JAWS study. Um, we serve with participants at different uh, critical milestones and time points, and we're currently analyzing those data this year. So we really hope to have data to share before the end of this year, including longitudinal data, um, and partner protection data, I think this is going to be a very rich data set, and we're currently um, analyzing those data. Um, and then Dr. Susida and myself and others, um, we are implementing um, a Delphi consensus building process to help resolve complex challenges in HIV care research, which include um, things like how to engage uh, population in cure-related research who carry the greatest burden of HIV, um, identifying domains of trust that affect participation and strategies to, to reduce mistrust in cure-related research with treatment interruptions, and then designing safe and meaningful cure uh, trials for people with full-time responsibilities. And this is done in collaboration with uh, the Well Project, uh, an organization that focuses on uh, the needs of, of women with HIV, and our wonderful community partner, uh, Bridgette Piku, as well. 
And then another project has been uh, to, to use social behavioral sciences to help inform how we can move trials to resource limited parts of the world. And so since 2018, pre-COVID, we've been collaborating with the Female Rising Through Education, Support and Health Cohort in German South Africa to really understand um, what would be needed to move cure-related trials with treatment interruptions to a setting like Durban that has a very high incidence rate of HIV. And this is a really unique uh, cohort that bridges HIV prevention, early treatment, and cure-related research. So young women at higher risk for HIV acquisition participate in a socioeconomic um, empowerment uh, program um, and take computer classes. They get uh, HIV RNA testing twice a week. And then if they do acquire HIV, um, they uh, have access to early treatment right away. So really early stages of HIV. And then as a result of that, most have had a uh, very small HIV reservoir, so it would be a very good candidate for a cure-related uh, clinical study. So in 2022, the one of the first um, clinical trials involving entirely women was launched in Durban, South Africa. And for this study, we really uh, are trying to support each participant and design a unique psychosocial support program for each participant to help navigate them through their ATI. Um, and so we have four cohorts of young women that we're following. Um, so one is the cure trial participants themselves, um, and then the, the women who were diagnosed in acute HIV who might be candidate for trials. And uh, participants also have the option of referring family member or like a sister, someone they've disclosed to, or a sex partner uh, for additional support. And we also um, have conducted um, formative work with um, community members who advise on the protocol. So just this past uh, month, we were able to present our first set of data at the IES 2023 meeting uh, via a poster. Um, with um, This is data from our uh, focus groups that we did with community members. And what we found is that disclosure is very difficult for young women. And a key finding from this study is that research teams should uh, provide disclosure support um, during ATI trials, but should not require or mandate um, disclosure to happen. So similar to what was found in HIV prevention with the microbicide trials. So here we found that there's a consensus that ATI participants should have autonomy to decide whether to inform partners, and we should provide additional support uh, for participants who are at risk of uh, intimate partner violence as well as really robust prevention support to partners if the participants have disclosed. Um, we also encourage the use of self-testing at home, particularly for, um, for women to take a self-test uh, with their partner at home and, and really begin that conversation. Um, and uh, with this study, we're really uh, advocating for trauma-informed and healing-centered approach as well. And hopefully we'll be able to add the NIMH logo to this slide, hopefully very soon. Um, I do wanna summarize some of the data from a systematic review that was just published about two weeks ago that is also highly relevant to this conversation. So this article summarizes evidence related to sexual transmission of HIV at varying viral load levels. So there were 244 studies of which eight were included in the analysis, contributing a lot of person years of follow-up and there were over 7,700 uh, serodifferent couples across 25 countries. And there was no HIV transmission when the partner with HIV had a viral load of less than 200 copies. And then almost zero risk of sexual transmission when the viral load was less than 100,000 copies per mil. So that was the threshold for the old uh, viral rebound protocols. Now with the set point protocols, we are asking participants to go above 1,000 copies sometimes up to 50,000 copies or even 100,000 copies. So we think we're gonna have to be very proactive about this. Um, but this article says that U equals U apply to people with HIV exper experiencing low level viremia. But then after that, um, U equals U is lost. Um, and then another paper published um, in 2000, 2001 during COVID 
was around balancing statistical power and the risk of HIV cure trial um, design. This was a modeling study um, that sort of estimated the risk of transmission during an ATI for those set point studies that do incorporate longer exposure to virus. And this study found that there would be a 3.6 per 1,000 participant uh, risk, like transmission rate if the threshold to restart ART was to be 100,000 copies per mil or more. And then transmission risk doubled for insertive anal intercourse and increased nearly 20-fold for insertive a receptive anal intercourse. So once again, we're going to have to be very proactive about this. And this is 2023. Um, and this year, uh, in June, we celebrated 40 years of the Denver principles, um, which were for people with HIV, nothing about us without us. Some of the language of the Denver principles may be a little outdated, but the principles remain. And it was really interesting to see that partners did figure in the Denver principles. Um, so in the Denver principles, we feel people with HIV and AIDS have an ethical responsibility to inform their sex partners of their health status. And then this was a, a perspective published almost 20 years ago on what makes clinical research in developing countries ethical and the benchmarks for ethical research. So in terms of moving ATI trials into the majority world, we think there's an urgent need to scale up participant and in particular women-centered approaches, particularly for extended ATI trials in Sub-Saharan Africa. We need to engage and plan early and often for ethical design robust partner protections are needed. This protects not only the partners, it also protects the participants. It protects the researchers, it protects the networks, it protects the field. And it also honors um, you know, the scientific achievements from the field of HIV prevention from the last four decades. Um, we also need strategic social behavioral sciences. This should be part of the design. Um, social behavioral scientists should not be volunteers on those trials. Uh, you know, that sounds a little obvious, but it's not always a given. And, and more and more, particularly following the COVID pandemic, there's an expectation for participant-centered design. So people do expect holistic approach to, to clinical trials. And we think social sciences can lead to more patient-centered outcomes in ethical research when included with basic clinical and translational research. So there are a lot of people who are part of this work. Um, a lot of wonderful collaborators at UCSF, um, including Dr. John Suceda, Dr. Paria Sabiri, my UCSF CAPS mentor, Mallory, Amy Conroy, who's part of the so Different Partner Project, Dr. Judy Auerbach, of course, Steve and Michael, um, and our wonderful community partners with the DARE Community Advisory Board. Everyone was part of the Positively Aware for part series, in particular, Tom Villa, the Partner Protection, um, package um, paper a group, including Annette Ridd from NIH, um, the Fresh SBR research team, in particular, Krista Dong, um, and then the ACTG Partner Protection Working Group, in particular, Tom Villa, and our wonderful dream team lab at UCSD. Um, and so um, before I move to the discussion question, we do have an open call for papers on participant-centered approaches on advances in HIV management, if you're interested in submitting. Deadline is World AIDS Day, and we can offer a discount. So with that, I will leave you all with some discussion questions. What, what is the responsibility of research teams around partner protections in HIV cure-related trials or treatment interruptions? Are partner protections or HIV transmission reduction strategies needed? And what would be some of the optimal next steps and research designs? Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, Corinne. That was amazing. Holy moly. Um, my head is spinning. There's just so many questions that I have. I just wanted to get to some of the questions that were in the chat as you were talking. Um, actually, maybe Patricia, if you're here, do you want to just come off mute? Oh, sure. I can turn yeah. my camera. Hi, Corinne. Hi, Hi Corinne. Hey, it's good to see so many people here that I respect and appreciate. Thank you for this amazing talk. And yeah, my question was because I was in conversation with my colleagues in Kampala about around PrEP, right? And how, you know, rolling out of PrEP was challenging for folks because even people didn't know about it. When you're going to have rollout of cure trials or whatnot, 
well, are the study teams or the NIH or all the people designing those trials now trying to think of offering PrEP as standard of care as an option for folks, partners of people who would be enrolling in these trials, right? As that being part of the funding strategy to make sure that that is offered as well. Is that going to become like a, a given, do you know, if there are discussions about that? So right now, there's still a lot of heterogeneity in how these trials are being planned and designed. Sometimes it's a conversation around referring for PrEP. Other times it's a conversation about active navigation of PrEP, like a warm transfer. So it really depends. Um, there's PrEP on site, and, and some of the trial teams are requiring sites to have a plan in place. Um, um, but I think that's it's and it's is it's part of the protocol, but I think it's we also know that it's much more than having prep available. Like we need to have HIV testing. There has to be uh, support tools, conversations. It's a process. There's a lot that needs to happen for prep um, uptake to occur. Um, so that is my answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, we also had a question from Richard, um, Richard Jeffries. I don't know, Richard, if you want, should, do you want me to just ask a question or do you want to come off mute if you're available? Sure thing, thanks so much for the great presentation, Karina. I was just wondering about the ACCG materials that were, that were shown that, that, that I think uh, you said Bill and, and um, Tom had generated and whether those might become publicly available at some point. Yeah, that's our goal. Uh, thank you, Richard. So the, uh, the tools are there, they're available. They're currently under review by the uh, Cure Transformative Science Group leadership and the leadership. And uh, we're hoping to format them as well. Um, so the uh, Outreach Recruitment and Retention Group, which is a volunteer group, is helping us with that as well. The goal would be that they would be centrally available and that um, people can uh, adapt them to their sites and their local context and really engage the local community advisory boards um, as well. So that's the goal. Fantastic, thank you. And John had also posted that on your website, persist.ucsf.edu, there's gonna be some other key resources. I just wanted to make sure we catch that on the recording for people who are watching the future. Yes. Um, any other questions? Uh, folks wanna raise their hands, come off mute, put it in chat. Go ahead, Patricia. Yeah, I do. I do have another question. So, Kareen, you mentioned in, in one of your slides the the necessity for having social behavioral being a funded part of the basic studies and whatnot, and that's something that's been advocated for for years. But do you know if there's a um, a shift that some of the more basic science studies um, at the NIH that they're going to be requiring or including funding? for social behavioral research to be part of the grant application process? That is a great question, Patricia. Um, we think that the way to go, if we really wanted the social behavioral sciences to be included, it would have to be mandated. Um, it's not a given that social sciences are included. Uh, personally, I think it should be part of the protocol activation plan, like similar to the way we have lab, we have data, then there should be a part for a community, a part for social behavioral sciences, like what do we need, you know, to activate a protocol so we know we're doing this um, the way it should be. Um, but at the, at the same time, right now it's being deprioritized, but we're constantly advocating for this, like 30% of my work uh, is advocacy. Um, and maybe I can ask Bill Freshwater, who's been part of the Partner Protection Working Group, to also talk about the kinds of advocacy we've been doing, and John Soseda as well in the ACTG. Um, and, and some of the trials like do include it, and they include it as part of the budget, as part of the protocol. Others do not. And sometimes it's an afterthought. So it's a constant. We have to constantly remind people and put this on the top of the, the radar. But I'd love Bill and John to chime in as well. Um, well, hi, uh, I'm Bill. Uh, I, you know, it's. I want to preface by saying, you know, thanks for including me this uh, in this, and how wonderful 
it is that we are discussing this. Um, I, I've been positive for 35 years, and I did an ATI back in 2017, 2018, the vedalizumab um, ATI, uh, as a matter of fact. And, uh, the, you know, partner protections were kind of limited to, you know, you know, there's a bowl of condoms, you know, you might want to take some, and and, and that doesn't work for everyone. So I, I think that, that um, especially as as studies get longer, I mean, I, I was off uh, my meds for I, I think eighty two days. I used to remember exactly how long it was because it was um, such a, a a big thing after having um, you know learned to always 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 take your meds and and having meds control your life. Um, that that um, you know to reach out to to people who haven't um, grown up. Uh, in the times like I did, where you had to learn how to negotiate to disclose your status. I mean, just, you know, now it's disclosing not only your status, but I was on meds, now I'm not on meds. So um, reaching out to to the people who will be necessary to be on these studies is, is huge because uh, my cohort is aging out, <laughs> you know, I'm 66. Uh, so, uh, uh, I just think it's it's a uh, it's a really important thing to make people aware that that because to step back to assume that everyone's going to practice uh, abstinence I think is an unrealistic um, uh, expectation especially as studies get longer um, I know I'm not um, I know I couldn't uh, uh, and I think that that um, so we've got to we've got to help people learn how to negotiate not only during the ATI, but, you know, once you restart your meds, because there's still that period after you restart your meds where you got to be careful. Um, and then there's the whole, um, I don't think it ends with the study because I was actually surprised um, after having lived through waiting for meds and then getting meds and taking them. Um, it was not as easy as I thought it would be to go back on meds because um, when you get off out of the habit of taking them, uh, it's kind of hard to get back to it, even though it was only a, a short period of time. But um, it, it was also in the back of your mind, you're always like, well, I was off for a while and, and I got uh, undetectable again really easily. So I think that that we've got to help people negotiate all of these by um, reaching out to to community groups and um, trying to get this message out there. Um, but again, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, I think John had to uh, step off really quickly. Um, so fortunately, he was able to give his uh, comments. I just I also just wanted to ask since Corinne, you and Michael Peluso and Bill are on the call. I wanted to see if you can also comment on long acting injectables for antiretroviral therapy and now that, you know, Bill, as you're saying, taking antiretrovirals is, be sorry, go ahead. Do you want to? Well, um, am I so, uh, so, you know, I, I think about that all the time, um, but uh, my worry, and, and it, it, it came up, uh, I can't remember who brought it up. My worry is always going to be, when does it flip off? Because with my meds, as long as I take my pills every day at the same time, I am able to say to myself, I'm comfortable. But on a long lasting um, injectable, for me, I would not be able to rest assured that I hadn't run out of my time, even though, you know, I mean, people are going to tell me, oh, yeah, you've got a two month window or a two week window. And that's why, to me, um, I, I would be all in for it. If I had a at-home test that was easy to do, that just told me detectable, not detectable, um, I think they've got to sort of go. For me, they've got to go hand in hand um, because I, I just would, um, you know, I think it's you know, growing up with with you know, Crixivan and taking pills three times a day and AZT six times a day. Um, that assurance, as long as I'm doing that, helped me. And long lasting, I, I think it's wonderful and would be, I would be all in for it as long as I had something easy that I could just say I'm still undetectable. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And there will be considerations with long acting. Of course, um, people who are on long acting cannot participate in ATI by definition. Um, usually we have to wait around two years. Um, and it depends also on the, the pharmacokinetic tail of the ATI the long-acting um, regimen. Um, 
And so there's a lot of considerations there. And maybe that's where we have many opportunities to engage with the community and engage care providers, because before someone switches to long acting, this would be the ideal uh, moment to be part of an ATI study uh, before they, they were to switch. So this could be a, a critical moment in the tra trajectory. And I think we're missing an opportunity if someone is willing to switch uh, before they go on long acting, um, just an idea. I see. So they would have to go, if they didn't and were on long acting, they have to go back to oral meds. Yeah. And then yeah. Yeah, exactly. there's a wash off period. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. Um, what I found striking yeah. was the way that this work relates to U equals U in local spaces. Um, curious what your findings and work is like uh, for U equals U in interpersonal relationships and within patient provider relationships like it, are your findings in dialogue with local health systems um, trying to translate you know the fact that health literacy on U equals U is is surprisingly low among these populations that's a great question, Ryan. So we just started doing some work with community clinicians around perceptions of care-related research. We haven't really looked at the provider-patient relationship. But this is also where we could uh, use a lot more dyadic approaches to care-related research, particularly as it relates to long-acting equals you participation in cure trials. So that would be a great area. Um, so I know of one study in Seattle and one survey in Philadelphia right now with providers, but we have a lot more work to do to engage providers at this critical juncture. And also in resource limited settings, right? Like, wow. um, so that would be, wow. as we scale up trials to resource limited parts of the world, it'd be great to engage um, providers as well. Great, thank you, Corinne. Um, Richard, Jeffrey, uh, do you Jeffrey, do you want to come off mute and just talk about the home-based thyroid load testing really quickly or just so we have it on? Sure, no, it just occurred to me that, you know, what, what Bill was asked, sort of uh, looking for, for in the context of long-acting uh, antiretroviral therapy would also be really helpful if people experience some period of post-treatment control and just want to know whether that control is still happening or or not. You know, I think I think the current home tests have got quite a high threshold, so I think that needs to be if if it needs to be brought down some more. I haven't been following it that closely, but that, but, that, but that's my impression. Karen, do you want to say anything about that? I know you're doing some projects around that. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It would be great to also have the home based viral load test uh, in the context of long acting. Uh, we are waiting some more granular reliability data, Richard, I think to be continued. Maybe we could have a separate webinar just on the home-based viral load um, test device. Sure thing. Yeah, no, I mean, it's kind of, for some reason, you know, at this point, I'm sort of hoping that technology technology is just going to be magical and, and it's going to just happen. And, and I realize it's not, unfortunately, not quite that certain. It's, it's close. It's close. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, Karen. This is really amazing. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating and great discussion. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to uh, email Rochelle or Karen directly. Um, and uh, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. So please follow us up. Follow us on YouTube. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Paria. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Karen. Thanks, Rochelle.